portion, and it will not be taken away from you. I don't want to show up in heaven and have God look at me and say, man, Andrew, you dummy. You chose poorly. You chose unwisely. You didn't choose the better portion. You didn't choose the good portion. I hope all of us one day on that final day that we will hear from Jesus himself saying, you have chosen the good portion. Now, the good portion uh, in other translations is translated as better portion. But my question for you all is this as we get started. What is the good portion? Jesus says, it's good that you chose this. Mary, it's, it was necessary and good that you chose this. So my question to you is, well, what is it? What is the good portion? And whatever it is, why should you choose it? Why is it better? Why is it a good portion? And so that's what I want to talk to you today about. My goal is to help you understand. Just answer those two questions. What is it? And why should we choose it? So when we enter this text, we're going to look at it by considering two questions. And the first question, I just realized the two questions should have been, what is it and why should you choose it? But those aren't actually my two questions. My two questions are, who is the real host and which sister are you really? Those are my, I just have two questions for us. Right? And I hope it's an interesting way into the text. So first question, who's the real host? In verse 38, it says that a woman named Martha welcomed him, that's Jesus, into her house. Now, Martha, she's the host of this gathering. So it's her house, meaning she is responsible to display the hospitality to welcome Jesus. Now, there's a huge distance in uh, both time and culture between us and the Bible. Because in the time of the Bible, hospitality was much more praised, much more valued, much more focused on and emphasized than it is today. Now, I'm not saying you guys aren't hospitable, but the reality is that most of us, I think it's pretty safe to generally say that we don't like other people in our homes, especially strangers, especially when they come unannounced, especially when they don't come invited. You know, there's recently uh, a a little comedy a uh, bit going around where this comedian basically compares hospitality today versus 20 years ago. And he makes this great observation that 20 years ago, if someone rang the doorbell, everyone in the house got excited. Oh, who's at the door? Who could it be? You turn the lights on and you run and you open the door and whoever it is, you welcome them in with joy. But nowadays it's different because when you hear the doorbell ring, everyone goes, Shh, shut up. <laughs> if the TV's on, you lower the volume, you dim the lights and you start questioning each other. Did you invite somebody? Are you expecting somebody? We get so paranoid. We get on edge. And the whole time, we just think if we you know, stay quiet long enough, they'll go away. Even though your car's in the driveway <laughs> and they saw your lights get dimmer. We have a hard time because we find people coming to our house as uh, intrusive or an interruption. Now, again, I'm not saying you personally are not welcoming, but generally our culture isn't one where hospitality and hosting are celebrated and practiced. But in the Bible, it's not only a cultural expectation, it was actually a biblical command. So you read verses like Romans 12, 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. 1 Peter... 4.9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So hospitality is not only a cultural expectation, it's a biblical command. So here we have in this story Martha. She's receiving Jesus into her home, and when she does this, she is both fulfilling cultural expectations and being obedient to a biblical command. But consider the nature of this visit. If Jesus Christ showed up to your door, how would you receive him? You see, because even the people who didn't believe in Jesus knew, at the very least, he was a very religious man, a leader. He was a rabbi, well-known, at the very least. But Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the three siblings, they knew Jesus well. They knew more. They knew he was the Son of God. They knew he was the long-awaited Messiah. They knew he was the Savior of the world. So talk about pressure. Talk about receiving this kind of person into your home. So let me ask you, Jesus tells you, hey, I'm coming over tonight. How do you prepare for that? What kind of spread do you put out for him? Do you put out cheese and crackers? Swiss cheese? Because it's the most holy? (laughs) Sorry, I had, you know, faster jokes. 
What does Jesus drink? Tea? Coffee? What if he doesn't like any, any of those? Do you just offer him water and say, well, Jesus, you can turn water into whatever you want, so here you go. How do you receive Jesus? Now, as if that's not enough pressure, who is coming over Martha's house? It's not just Jesus. If you notice here in the text, verse 38, it says, now as they went on their way. Why is it plural? Because Jesus never traveled alone. He always had an entourage. He rolled 13 deep, right? Him, his 12 disciples. So when he showed up at your house, he would clear out your pantry, clear out your fridge. So Martha, one day is in the house. Jesus comes by. Oh, it's great to see you, Jesus. But behind him, 12 hungry bellies. Unexpected. He didn't RSVP. All of you know how frustrating it is when people don't give you the heads up. Have you ever organized a Facebook event? Right? Some of you are like, amen to that. Because you say, oh, who's coming? And you invite 100 people, you get 10 responses and 9 are maybes. And this isn't helpful. And remember the time of the Bible. It's the first century. Jesus shows up with 12 other people. She can't pick up the phone and call and order pizza or Chinese takeout. She can't just, oh, I'm, I'm going to drop by the store and pick up a few things. She can't pull out her freezer and take out a you know, pack of Tyson chicken wings she got from Costco. She, she can't do that. What does she do? She has to go into her pantry, and she has to see, okay, what do I have, and what can I begin to prepare? So it makes sense. Jesus is in your house. Martha wants to do her best to prepare a wonderful meal. She wants, now that Jesus is under her roof, she wants to give him rest and refreshment. And so all of us, I hope you would want to do the same. So her aspirations are noble, her intentions, they're really good. But the question is, for us, well, then can we really blame her when she snaps at Mary? When she snaps at Mary for not helping, right? I sympathize with Martha. I resonate with her when she gets angry and she goes to Jesus and says, well, Jesus, what is Mary doing here? I imagine the scene like this. Jesus shows up. Martha counts how many people. She goes to the kitchen. But as she heads to the kitchen, Mary heads to the living room with Jesus, leaving all the responsibility and all the burden to fall on her older sister. And every older brother in here, every older sister, right, the eldest, all of you know how infuriating it is when their younger siblings just expect things to be done. I mean, does Mary not have any common sense? If she heads to the living room... Does she just expect food to appear magically? If she sits at the feet of Jesus, does she just expect the tables to be set on her own? Isn't Mary being a little bit selfish? Now, I totally understand Martha's stress. I think you do too. So then isn't it surprising when Martha comes to complain to Jesus, it's Jesus who says to Martha in verse 41, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things kind of a twist in the story. There's a little surprise because Jesus is actually pointing out, Martha, listen, you think Mary's in the wrong, but you're the blind one because you don't understand what I'm doing in your house. You see, Martha thought Jesus came into her house to be refreshed, to receive rest, and that Martha should play the host. She doesn't actually realize that Jesus has come to give the rest and to give the refreshment. Because if you see in the text, there's a contrast. Martha is preparing, trying to prepare a good portion for Jesus. But what does Jesus say? Mary's already in the living room receiving the good portion. Martha's trying to prepare a feast for Jesus, but Mary is already feasting on what Jesus has prepared for her. Martha wants to do her very best with the food that she presents. But Mary is receiving her fill in Jesus' presence. Choosing the good portion means choosing Jesus over everything else. And the reality is, like Martha, we often miss the point. When you became a Christian or when you become a Christian and Jesus enters your life, he enters your life as your host. He enters your life ready to serve you, feed you, give you rest, nourish your soul. He doesn't come into your life demanding now, all right, I've come into your life now. You host me. You serve me. You prepare a meal for me. 
You see, if you understand the gospel that way, you've actually misunderstood the gospel. Jesus himself says, I came into the world not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. What does Jesus want from you? He wants you to rest in him. That's why when he shows up in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Work to do? I will give you rest. He wants you to choose him as your good portion. He doesn't want you running around trying to impress him with your good performance. So who's the host of the story? It's Jesus Christ. And this is why Mary has chosen the better portion, because she is sitting at Jesus' feet, receiving from him. She's not working her fingers down to the bone. She's opening up her hand and saying, Jesus, I'm ready to receive what you have to give me. Now, you got to know this, because when Jesus came to the world, he didn't come expecting to be met with the hospitality of his friends, but to be met with the hostility of his enemies. He came into the world so that through the cross, he could offer you the rest that your soul needs. Isn't this interesting that at the Last Supper, who's the host? It's Jesus Christ. What is he giving you? His body and his blood. He's the good portion. So my question to you is, do you actually believe that Jesus has come into the world to serve you and to die in your place? Do you believe that he's done all the work in your place so that you don't need to perform and achieve, but instead freely receive all that he wants to offer to you? If you miss this part of the gospel, you will become Martha. You'll begin working hard for Jesus, but neglecting to walk hard with him. How many of you are working hard for Jesus, but not walking hard with him? You try to impress him with good performance when he says, I just want you to take the good portion. You see, this is the... This is why the gospel is it's so amazing, because the gospel is not a help wanted ad from God saying, here's what I want from you. It's a help available ad. Here's what I will do for you. This is why I have come. The portion is a person, and choosing the good portion means choosing Jesus. So that's the first question. Who is the real host? Second question is this. Which sister are you really? Now, I ask that because the two sisters in this passage are often compared and contrasted with each other. I don't know about you, but I've heard so many sermons where Mary and Martha are used as a sort of biblical personality test. Have you ever heard this question, which are you, a Mary or a Martha? Have you ever heard that before? Oftentimes, um, what they mean by that is this. The Marthas are those who are very type A personality Right here, when Jesus comes in, what's the first thing she does? She goes and she serves. They say Marthas are those who are heavy-footed on the gas pedal, so they're always ready to work and they're always ready to serve. Right? Marthas are about serve, 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 and do, do, do. What needs to be done? What else can I do? Is everything taken care of? Do you need help with that? Right? And in a church plant like Grace Point North, you guys need Marthas. Church planters love the Marthas because they're game changers. Right? They would take one Martha to five Marys any day. And then you get people who are like Marys. Marys are type B personality. They don't have a ten- tendency to be heavy foot on the gas pedal with the brake pedal. They slow down. They meditate and they contemplate on what they've heard. They reflect on their feelings and their relationship with God. And, you know, they smile and they listen to Caleb and they're on the car. And, you know, they're busy sitting and listening and loving and feeling. And what's going on in my heart? You know, that kind of stuff. And preachers love Marys. Because whereas Martha's are in service and they're just like, oh, the coffee is cooking and I need to set up the donuts. And the Marys are seeing they're taking notes and they're smiling and they're listening. And preachers love the Marys because they look at them and they feel like they're bombing. They're looking for the Mary. Who's taking the notes? Who's laughing at the jokes? Who's, who, who's encouraging me? Who's being fed with this? Whereas the Martha's are like, oh, man, children, I'm just going to end soon. And I have to do this and that and that. Maybe you've heard it put this way. I don't know if you have or not, but this, I grew up a lot with preachers asking, pastors asking, well, which are you? You can't be a Martha. You need to be a Mary. 
And so we love, I mean, our generation, we love personality tests, right? We love um, the Myers-Briggs test. Oh, what are you? We love the five love languages, right? We love all that kind of stuff. And so there's a way in which we may love and look at the scripture and say, yeah, which, which one am I? Am I a Mary or a Martha? But I don't think that's the point. It's not the point of the text. Jesus does not give this, or Luke does not record the story. Jesus does not say these things in order to get you to realize that you, or to get you to figure out whether you're a Mary or a Martha. That's not his point at all. I think the point of the text is to show us that we are all, in fact, Marthas. We are all like Martha. Now, why do I say that? Because all of us, in some way or another, we relate to God. We view our relationship with God on some level based on our performance. We all use what we've done for him or what we haven't done for him as a measure of how we are doing spiritually. Think about it. Martha feels superior to Mary because of what she's doing for Jesus, what Martha's doing for Jesus, and what Mary isn't doing for Jesus. Martha, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's serving. Verse 40, Martha is serving. Verse 39, Mary is sitting. Well, which is better, sitting or serving? Well, if you put it that way, (laughs) serving is better, isn't it? But we're told that Martha's serving was a distraction. It was causing her to miss the point. It was causing her to lose focus. And then Jesus actually goes ahead and he says, what Mary is doing, this is more necessary. You think I want from you people who run around and are busy all the time and are serving God and and feel so self-justified, better than other people, critical of other people, judging other people because of the work they've done and the other works that people don't do? Jesus says, I don't want that. What Mary is doing, sitting at my feet, that's more necessary. We think, oh, God, you love work, work, work. And God's saying, no, I want worship, worship, worship. Anytime that you substitute the presence of Jesus with the preparations you make for him, you're being like Martha. Anytime you substitute the worship of Jesus with works that you do for him, you are being a Martha. Every time that you choose serving over sitting, every time you choose laboring over listening, every time you choose being, uh, feeding others over being fed, you are being like a Martha. Now, you are not a Martha if you serve the church and are involved in ministries and love doing things for God. I'm not saying that. So all those in the church plan who are hard servants who came early and set up the chairs and do all that, I'm not saying that's what makes you a Martha. What makes you a Martha is when you rely on what you have done or what you haven't done as the primary way to assess your relationship with God. You are a Martha when your successes or your failures determine how you feel you're doing spiritually. Isn't this true? When it comes to successes, maybe some, some of you feel superior and worthy before God because you're doing a lot of good things. I'm doing a lot for the church. I feel good. And then some of you, you feel bad about yourself. You feel inferior. You feel unworthy before God because you're not doing enough good things. Oh, I should be doing more. However you cut it, that's the attitude of Martha. Now, some of you, when it comes to failures, some of you say, feel righteous, you feel innocent before God because you're staying away from bad things. And then some of you are feeling unrighteous and guilty because you've participated in bad things. However you cut it, you're being a Martha. So whether by successes, oh, I'm doing enough, oh, I'm not doing enough. Failures, yes, I've stayed away from them, oh, I'm sunken into failures. Either way, if you base any one of those four options as the way to relate to God, you are being a Martha. That's the attitude of Martha. Every Sunday, as you walk in through the doors, what determines whether you will come before God with your held, head held high and feeling, okay, I've come to worship and give my all. What determines that versus when you come in and you put your head a little lower and you think, man, I really don't deserve to be here. Is it not your performance Parents who yell at their kids in the morning, get up, kicking them to the minivan. You come to the door, I'm a horrible parent, and you feel a little lower. Some of you, some things you did last night, you wake up with a big headache, you come into the door, 
based on your performance last night, you feel spiritually not as good. Some of you, this morning, you woke up. Maybe it's because you slept early. You woke up, you had time to read the Bible. You feel good about it. She's like, you come in, you're whistling. I have every right to, I can lift my hand today. <laughs> right? If you base your spirituality, your relationship with God, based on your performance, whether through your failure or your successes, you are being a Martha. Do you see this in yourself? In verse 40, Martha, she, she is a woman of audacity. She marches right into the room where Jesus and Mary are. She stands at the door. I can just imagine the scene. She's exasperated. I can I imagine her. Just, she's wearing an apron, and her hair is disheveled, and she has flour, like, in her face. And, you know, you know she's been at work in the kitchen, and she has both hands on her waist, and she has the audacity. This woman has the audacity to yell at Jesus Christ, the Son of God. She says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Well, if you were to ask Martha five seconds ago, Martha, why are you in the kitchen working so hard? Oh, because Jesus is here. This is for Jesus. Two seconds later, she's in the room going, God, don't you see that Mary has left me alone? Tell her to help me. Whoa, 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 Martha, when did it become about you? You just said you were doing this all for Jesus, and now you're being utterly selfish. Why? Because you were never really doing it for Jesus. You were always doing it for yourself. And so in the end, she's the one who's offended. Jesus isn't offended. Jesus doesn't listen to Martha and go, that's right. How can, how can that risotto cook itself? Mary, get in there. That's not what he says. He rebukes Martha, and that's the twist. That's the surprise ending of this story. Jesus isn't at all bothered. Martha's measuring cup has all of a sudden become her measuring stick. And by that, she's going around, and she's putting it up against people. She puts that measuring cup, that measuring stick against herself. She passes. She goes up to Mary. She puts it against Mary. Mary fails. Now her heart is critical, judgmental, condemning. And she begins to judge others, judges Mary, not according to Jesus' standards, but according to her own standards. Jesus, rebuke Mary for not helping Rebuke her for her laziness and her selfishness compared to me, who is working so hard for you. So I'm going to say it again. Anytime that you stand before God and you feel justified, or maybe you feel unjustified, some of you feel holy before God, or maybe some of you feel sinful, you feel accepted, maybe you feel rejected. If that's ever based on what you have or haven't done, you're living like a Martha. Anytime you stand before others, you feel superior to them or inferior to them. You feel more righteous than them. You feel less righteous than them. You feel you have the right to judge and criticize them. You don't feel like you do. If you base these things on what you have or haven't done, you are being a Martha. But praise God that Jesus Christ refuses to use Martha's measure of merit to judge He says, no, Mary is not wrong. Mary has not chosen incorrectly. Martha, you're distracted. Mary, she's chosen the good portion. Why? Because Mary has chosen to sit at his feet and receive what is more necessary. What is that? Christ himself. Jesus himself. Martha is so distracted from Christ with all of her cooking and her catering and her caring and her cleaning. But Jesus doesn't measure Mary based on her actions for him. Jesus based her his opinion of her based on her affections for him. Jesus doesn't measure Mary based on her dutiful serving, but based on her delight in receiving. Jesus doesn't measure Mary based on her busyness in the kitchen, but in her blessedness sitting at his feet. Why? Why does Jesus care more about your worship of him than your work for him? Why does he care more that you listen to him than you labor for him? And the answer is because all the work and all the labor that God ever required of you, Jesus Christ has done it. Jesus has already done it for you. He's already done it in your place. Mary understood it. That's why she was comfortable resting. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived the perfect life. He died the perfect death. 
He finished the work of salvation. He did everything in complete obedience to God so that God is now satisfied. And Mary understands that if she rests in that, if she rests in what Jesus has accomplished, this portion will never be taken away from her. If you rest in the work of Jesus, that will never be taken away from you. But if you rest in your own work, you got to be careful. Because depending on your quality of work and your quantity of work, God can either say, oh, that was good, you're in. That's it, you're out. But through Jesus Christ, he says, that is perfect. You're in and you're all the way in. Which portion will you choose? To rest in the person of Jesus or to rest in your own performance? Jesus finished work. All that he's done, you don't need to add to it. And this is how I think about it. Let's say I invited you over. I cooked you a wonderful meal. It was exquisite. And then afterwards, you, and I said, how was that? And you said, it's so good. And I say, how good? And, you're, and you say, well, so good that I'm actually going to go back in the kitchen and, and make something else. And I'll go, well, if it was so good, why aren't you satisfied with it? Why would you go back in the kitchen? You go in the back in the kitchen makes me suspect that, one, it wasn't that good. Two, it wasn't enough. Three, you can do better. Jesus Christ has finished his work on the cross. So when you say, okay, well, thanks, Jesus, for that. But here, I'm going to start doing things for you. What are you saying about Jesus? That what he did on the cross wasn't enough? That it wasn't good enough? Just like I don't need you going back into the kitchen to complete my work. Jesus doesn't need you going back to the cross to finish what he started. It's already done, and it's perfect. All he wants of you is to rest in it. Now, I'll close just by applying this to this group as I thought and prayed about you all. This makes it sound like if you believe in the gospel, it's okay to be lazy. (laughs) Nah, you don't need to do it. That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's only when you truly rest in the gospel that that becomes true fuel for kingdom labor. As a church plant, there are a lot of things that need to be done. As a church plant, there's always the pressure. You want to succeed. You don't want to fail. You want to flourish. You don't want to shrivel. But the success of a church is not found in the productions you put forth or in the programs you create or all of the hours of preparation you invest. It's easy to think that way, but that is not the true measure of success for any church. It's tempting to think that your success is found in the things you are doing when the real test of success for this ministry and this church is how the people of God are enjoying the good portion. How the people in this church are enjoying Jesus Christ and are resting in his work. Why is that the true test? Because it's only when that happens that you can then properly labor and work for God. Here's what I mean. Before you want to roll up your sleeves and get to work, you got to learn to sit and begin to worship. Because it's only as you begin with worship that all of your work becomes worshipful. If you don't start with worship, your work becomes self-worship. It becomes earning. It becomes trying to find your own significance, your own value. But if you start with worship, then all of your work follows the path of worship. It's like when you put on a dress shirt. If you want to make sure all the buttons are in line, where do you start with? You start with the top button. Do any of you ever start in the middle and then you finish and you look dumb because your shirt is the wrong way? Start in the middle and guarantees everything else will fall in line. You start with worship of Jesus and all your work for Jesus will fall in line. You start with worship so that all of your labor then follows forth in love. If you are empowered by the gospel, if each of you are resting in Jesus, satisfied and knowing and completely refreshed in all that he's done for you, then your service in the kingdom, you're not doing it for your salvation. You're not trying to score points with God. If you're resting in the gospel, then your service in the kingdom isn't about your sanctification. You're not trying to gain status before God. If you rest in the gospel, your service in the kingdom is for your Savior, and your satisfaction comes from serving him. 
So choosing the good portion means choosing Jesus Christ. And this will empower you to serve, to labor, to work hard for the king. So it's my prayer that on the final day when the work of Grace Point North is finished, when the work of all kingdom outposts and all churches is done and complete and Jesus calls you home, that each one of you can hear Jesus say, good job, you have chosen the good portion. You have chosen to rest in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which does a funny thing because it corrects us. It gives us surprises. It flips the things we know inside out and upside down. That's the way your gospel works. That's the way the principle of grace operates. Father, I pray for all of my friends here that they will have got this today. Lord, you know I'm still learning it. You know that none of us moves beyond the gospel. We can only fall deeper into it. It's like a deep, deep well. We're not called to jump over it, but jump into it. And as we jump into the gospel, I pray that we would learn first and foremost to rest in Jesus and all he's done for us. He's come to host us. And I pray, Lord, that then all my friends here, as they are resting in Christ, as they are worshiping Christ, that out of that heart, they would then work for Christ, serve him, labor. But their heart would begin with Christ first. Choosing the good portion first. And so, Father, continue to bless the work of this church. Continue to bless the ministry and the gospel that goes out in all forms, not only through the preaching, but through its outreach, through its evangelism and witness, through its mercy, through the ordinary ways that each Christian here is going out into their workplace, into the communities, into their neighborhoods as your light. Continue to do your good work through them. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to remain seated as we...